Good morning. It's Tuesday, November 23rd. We're glad you're checking out Top Story. A little Thanksgiving treat for you this week. We're loading the full World Watch show and a little fair warning too. You want to make sure you jump on a great opportunity this weekend when you'll be able to order six months of the show for yourself, family or friends for just $20. Hope you enjoy this sample of the full show and take time to like and subscribe below. Now, this is World Watch. V for victory. Farmers in India are celebrating. This after Prime Minister Modi announced a complete turnaround on controversial farming laws. We have decided to withdraw all three agricultural laws. In the parliament session starting later this month, we will complete the constitutional process. The legislation had affected how farmers would sell their crops. Passed in September of last year, it aimed at regulating farm produce markets where the government used to set guaranteed minimum prices. But farmers worried removing the minimums would cut their profits and also feared the law would allow big businesses to dominate the farming industry. In a nation of 1.3 billion people, some two thirds rely on agriculture for their livelihood. India's new laws sparked mass protests last year, which never stopped, at times turning violent. With the repeal underway, farmers are beginning to see the fruit of their persistence, but they're not going home until the reversal becomes official. When it is completed in writing, only then will we go, even if it takes one, two or three months. The government's sudden new turn comes ahead of several elections next year. Good news out of Haiti. Two of the 17 missionaries kidnapped near Port-au-Prince more than a month ago were freed on Sunday. 16 U.S. citizens, five of which are children, as well as one Canadian, are among those taken. The group was in Haiti working with Ohio-based organization Christian Aid Ministries. All 17 of them, along with their driver, were abducted by Haitian gang members on their way back from visiting an orphanage. Details such as which two hostages are free, where they are now, and why kidnappers release them has not been made public. We can confirm that two were released, that's all we can say. Christian Aid Ministries said in a written statement that the freed members are safe, in good spirits, and being cared for. A spokesman for Haiti's National Police also verified the release of the two missionaries. While their freedom is cause for rejoicing, the focus remains on the people still in captivity. Pfizer has applied for FDA approval for an antiviral COVID-19 pill. The drug, called Paxlovid, can be taken as an at-home treatment. In a clinical trial, it lowered the risk of hospitalization or death when given to COVID patients within the first three days of symptoms. The antiviral treatment could be especially helpful in countries with limited vaccine access. Pfizer has signed an agreement to allow other drug manufacturers to produce generic versions of the drug drug, which will give low and middle income countries access to the treatment. The White House has already signed a deal with Pfizer to obtain 10 million courses of the experimental pill at a cost of $5.29 billion. The FDA has yet to approve Paxlovid or another antiviral pill from Merck. The Anaheim Angels two-way baseball star Shohei Otani is the American League's MVP and fans from his home country are loving it. He is the same age as my son. He has done such an amazing job. I think he is very mature and professional, both mentally and physically. Excited Tokyoites are finding the 27-year-old space on every newspaper and in every sporting store. Otani is not only a fiend at the plate, hitting 46 home runs and 100 RBIs, the Japanese star dominates the mound, pitching a total of 130 innings, adding 156 strikeouts to his impressive resume. Japan suggested a national honor be granted to Otani, which he declined, saying it was still too early. Today's World Watch is sponsored by Boyce College at Southern Seminary. Student life experiences built upon biblical truth. 
I'm sure you visited your local library and maybe you've even checked out books from a bookmobile, you know, one of those buses that works like a mobile library. But Hannah Harris says a librarian in Indonesia has found a way to trade books for trash. <laughs> Hannah, that doesn't sound like it even trade. At first, it seemed like kind of a garbage move to me too, Brian, but it's actually a great way to get people to stop littering and start reading. Every weekday, librarian Raiden Roro Hindardi stocks her shelves with books. But these bookshelves aren't lining the walls of a hushed library. They're attached to a truck bed. She visits several neighborhoods in the central Java province in Indonesia. Kids can choose from the 6,000 books that make up her mobile library. And in exchange, the children give her plastic cups, bags, and other trash, which she then sells to buy more books. From what I can see, when there's too much trash, our environment will become dirty and it's not healthy. That's why I looked for trash to rent a book. Hendardi says she collects more than 200 pounds of trash each week. Library workers sort the garbage to sell or recycle. And as the project grows, Hendardi hopes it will encourage more residents to properly dispose of their trash. So far, about 75 people participate in the exchange. Hendardi started the Trash for Books project in her hometown in 2014, but it stalled out after a year. We faced a crisis in 2015 when we were short-staffed and interest in visiting the library was declining. So in 2016, the local government provided us with a three-wheeler vehicle and donated some books. From there, we combined the two things. Now she can bring her library directly to the kids, who can borrow as many books as they want. Many of the kids didn't have access to a library until Hendardi came along with her garbage truck full of books. I know Thanksgiving is still two days away, but I can already smell the turkey and gravy. Scents are one of the best parts of holidays, starting with Thanksgiving dinner and continuing right into the Christmas season. But reporter Kayla Bailey is saying for many this year, those familiar aromas will be a little, well, off. Brian, we know that one of the symptoms of COVID-19 is a loss of smell and or taste, but doctors are also seeing these symptoms go on past recovery. A study published by the JAMA Medical Journal estimates more than 1 million people in just the U.S. have not regained their sense of smell months after contracting COVID-19. It might just sound like a minor inconvenience to you and me with our noses working, but for people plagued with a loss of smell for months, it's a serious problem. The person disconnects from the world. If there's a gas leak, they don't smell it. If the food is bad, they don't smell it. Frequently, loss of smell leads to loss of taste or appetite. It becomes an act. You don't have to eat, you have to feed yourself, and you don't enjoy it. Researchers in Spain have gathered similar data to the U.S. And at the Mutua Terrassa Hospital in Barcelona, therapists are actually working to help people recover their olfactory sense through smell training. It involves sniffing different odors over a long process of months to regain the numbed sensory ability. Rehabilitation olfactory training. There's an improvement between those who do and those who do not. Some articles say 30% improvement. Understanding the science behind partial or complete loss of smell is difficult. Early in the pandemic, scientists feared the virus was attacking olfactory neurons, which would indicate lasting neurological or brain damage. But scientists have since realized that these neurons lack a certain type of receptor for the virus to latch onto. Instead, it appears the virus is attacking what are called sustentacular cells, which balance salt ions in the nasal mucus. That throws off kilter the whole process of receiving odors and transmitting those signals to the brain. Whether it is complete loss of smell, anosmia, or a distorted sense of smell, parosmia, it's unsettling and patients welcome the chance to retrain their senses. Archaeologists in Brazil have uncovered the remains of a very rare dinosaur. It probably looked something like this. The dino was a biped, meaning walked on two legs, and stood just two and a half feet tall. But one thing that has scientists a bit confused, the little guy didn't have teeth, but he belongs to a group of carnivorous dinosaurs. How could he possibly be a meat eater without teeth? It's possible that he used his beak to rip meat apart, similar to falcons and other carnivorous birds. Researchers published their findings in a scientific journal, saying it was one of the most complete dinosaurs found from the Cretaceous period in Brazil. Here are a pair of stories I call animals sticking a nose where it doesn't belong, like this cat in a can. 
Firefighters in Turkey had to use metal cutters to free a stray feline that got a bit greedy and then a bit stuck. It took eight minutes before the firefighters could pry the cat's head loose. Then it sprinted off without a word of thanks. And then there's this guy, a squirrel whose eating habits landed him behind bars. A London family found the full-bellied squirrel trapped in their bird feeder. They called the local animal rescue officer and, once again, we see a pair of metal cutters put to work. A woman in the background gives the gluttonous little guy a few words to think on for the future. I wonder if you hadn't eaten so many nuts, she wouldn't have got stuck in there. It's not pictured, but we hear the squirrel was eventually freed unharmed. Make sure to check out the full site at worldwatch.news. You can try out the show free for a month. And remember, whatever the news, the purpose of the Lord will stand.